The uh, committee will come to order. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Chairman Brown, thank you for being with us today. It is my understanding, Mr. Mayor, uh, you have uh, city business to, uh, to tend to, which we um, understand and appreciate, and we want to be very good stewards of your time. So uh, my friend Mr. Davis and I are going to waive our opening statement so we can spend more time with you and Chairman Brown. And again, on behalf of all of us, thank you for, uh, thank you for being uh, with us. It is the, uh, the policy of the uh, of the committee to swear all witnesses. So I would ask uh, both Mayor Gray and Chairman Brown to rise with me and raise your right hands. Do you sw solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? May the record reflect both witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, mayor Vincent Gray, the Mayor of the District of Columbia, and recognize him for his five-minute opening remarks. Uh, could you turn your mic on, please? Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Gowdy and uh, other members of the committee. Uh, I am Vincent C. Gray, uh, Mayor of the District of Columbia, and I am here today to talk about our proposed uh, Fiscal Year 12 District of Columbia budget. Uh, I've had to make tough choices in submitting this budget, choices that, frankly, I wish I didn't have to make. Uh, the reality is that the financial health and backbone of our city could be imperiled unless thoughtful, balanced, and measured choices are made and honored. This budget was the product of three very intense months of scrubbing agency budgets and exploring every reasonable option for additional revenue. I participated in over 100 hours of intensive meetings focused exclusively on the budget with the City Administrator, our Deputy Mayors, Agency Directors, and our Office of Budget and Finance. This budget meets and addresses the reality we face, a reality that I have discussed in town hall meetings with district residents in all eight wards during the past several weeks. In order to close a $322.1 million structural budget gap, I employed a balanced approach of expenditure reductions and revenue increases. My budget focuses on four key priorities of my administration, fiscal stability, high quality public education, jobs and economic opportunities, and safe communities. My goal is to ensure a structurally balanced budget. The fiscal year 2012 gross funds budget for the District of Columbia is $8.986 billion, representing an increase of $164.69 million, or a 1.9 percent increase above the fiscal year 2011 approved budget. The majority of the 1.9 percent growth occurred in two areas. Uh, Ninety-six-plus million dollars occurred in public education, largely due to enrollment increases in both D.C. public schools and D.C. public charter schools, and $67.76 million occurred in our financing and other appropriation titles, due largely to mandatory increases in debt service for capital borrowing under the previous administration. This budget has been certified as balanced by the independent chief financial officer, who you will hear from later. I would like to take this opportunity to deal each one of my four key detail each one of my four key priorities in this budget. The first is to introduce a budget that reestablishes fiscal stability in the District of Columbia. When we met with the bond rating agencies in February, all three agencies highlighted three recommendations for ensuring the district's reputation on Wall Street after the last four years in which our fund balance was spent down by 41 percent from $1.5 billion to $890 million. They underscored the need to have a structurally balanced budget, meaning we would not spend more than uh, we take in, uh, to live within the debt cap of 12 percent, which we uh, have established, and rebuild the fund balance. My fiscal year 12 budget achieves those goals. High quality education is the second of my four key priorities. Providing high-quality education uh, for all district residents is critical to our long-term prosperity. This budget provides the resources necessary to continue the pace of school reform and to provide an educational continuum from ages 3 to 24. My ultimate goal will be to extend this continuum to ages 1 to 2 as the economy rebounds and more funding becomes available. The increases in the budget for D.C. public schools and D.C. public charter schools are due principally to increased enrollment. We are now beginning to witness the success of the Universal Pre-Kindergarten Program. We are retaining students who enter the pre-K programs at its inception through a growth of enrollment in grades K uh, through uh, 2. We also have included increases for the first time in years for the University of the District of Columbia, especially our community college, including $4 million. 
and also this, uh, this budget focuses on beginning to solve a longstanding problem of spending tens of millions of dollars to educate children with disabilities in nonpublic schools. Job creation and economic opportunities uh, for all district residents is the third of my key priorities. Uh, despite reductions to Federal and special purpose revenue, um, I am continuing to fund adult, adult job training by adding $2.6 million to the fiscal year 12 budget. As everyone knows, I have been a major proponent of the concept of one city. However, the current disparity between areas of our city uh, is particularly pronounced in the area of jobs with a number of communities experiencing chronic uh, unemployment. In Ward 7, 17 percent, Ward 8, 25 uh, percent. The fourth priority is sustaining safe communities so that residents feel safer in their neighborhoods. Most of the agency budgets in the public safety and justice cluster were held constant in their, at their fiscal year 2011 level, 2011 level, level but we are providing funding to hire 140 police officers to reopen the police academy, which essentially had been uh, shut off. Um, Mr. Chairman and the members of the committee, the District of Columbia raises over $5.5 billion per year in local funds from our residents in property taxes, sales taxes, and income taxes. A majority of the functions of the District Government, including all the services provided by any other State, are funded through those locally raised dollars. Nevertheless, it is the lengthy and complicated Federal appropriations process that has severe effects on the District Government. As you know, in order to comply with the Federal process, the District must develop its budget months in advance uh, of the time frame needed by the City. In fact, the District has had to adopt the Federal fiscal year of October 1 to September 30, when another fiscal year may be more appropriate for the City. The Congressional appropriation schedule uh, prevents uh, the District from being able to make better uh, and more current revenue estimates and expenditure needs that lead to a budget based on better and more complete data. Further, the dual nature of the Federal appropriations process requires two affirmative actions by Congress. The District's appropriations are often caught up in national policy disputes that typically delay our local budget enactment and that have nothing to do uh, with the District of Columbia. This flaw was made abundantly clear uh, a month ago when the District was forced to spend its very limited funds preparing for a potential uh, shutdown. Our Chief Financial Officer in an assessment indicated we could have lost between $1 and $6 million uh, a week as a result of the shutdown. Um, the, uh, Mr. Chairman, the District of Columbia's overall fiscal health is strong. Uh, for more than a decade, we have presented a balanced budget and we have received clean audits in each of those years. As has been noted by members of Congress, we have clearly demonstrated our fiscal responsibility. I believe strongly, Mr. Chairman, that the financial rigor the District exhibits proves that we are more than capable of managing our own resources. It is time for Congress to adopt legislation that would remove the approval of the District's local budget from the Federal appropriation process. This request does not remove the oversight authority of Congress, of course, as provided for uh, in the Constitution. It would simply allow the District to spend its local funds in the same way other State and local jurisdictions uh, do. I have detailed reasons why I believe budget autonomy would facilitate the ability to run the city, and we hope that the, uh, that the Congress uh, and this committee will consider that. Again, thank you very much for your time uh, and having me here today to talk about the fiscal year 12 budget, and uh, we will be happy to try to answer any questions you may have today and uh, as we move forward. Uh, as a final point, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for coming over to meet with us a few weeks ago uh, at the Wilson Building. Uh, it's most appreciated. I think it's established a uh, constructive working environment, and we look forward to continuing to work with you. Well, Mr. Mayor, um, before I introduce uh, Chairman Brown, uh, you were uh, a very gracious host, and uh, to take somebody from South Carolina who hadn't visited the District of Columbia since he was a kid in high school, uh, you've done a wonderful job helping introduce me to your a beautiful, magnificent city, and I, and I thank you for your time. I know you have a very busy schedule. For you to take time to be with me a couple of weeks ago was uh, very much appreciated. I was so, delighted to you. do it, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, my pleasure to uh, recognize the Honorable Kwame Brown, Chairman of the District of Columbia City Council. Mr. Brown. Well, good morning, uh, Chairman uh, Gowdy, Ranking Member uh, Davis, and members of the Subcommittee on Health Care, the District of Columbia Census, and National Archives. I'm Kwame R. Brown, Chairman of the Council of the District of Columbia, the District's elected legislator. I'm pleased to speak with you today about the Council's role 
and developing the District's fiscal year 2012 appropriations request. This year, the Council has the difficult task of reviewing and finalizing a budget that continues to provide necessary services to residents, businesses, and visitors of the District of Columbia. Despite the slow pace of recovery from the recession, I would like to commend uh, Mayor Gray and the CFO uh, for submitting a balanced and structurally sound budget proposal to the Council. I think the Mayor's proposal uh, does not use the District's fund balance to pay for reoccurring services. It keeps in, pay, in place uh, funds created to reduce the debt and replenish our reserve. Uh, these aspects of the District's budget are particularly important to bond rating companies, a message that was conveyed to the Mayor Gray and the CFO Gandhi and myself during a recent visit expressing that this was an issue for them. Over the next two weeks, the Council will continue to review their budget proposal before voting on the Fiscal Year 2012 Budget Request Act on May 25th. We are poised to follow the District's practice, Mr. Chairman, now entering the 16th year of submitting a balanced budget to Congress. Major cost drivers for the budget in include ever-increasing health care costs as well as the District's continuing education reform efforts, a commitment shared by both the Mayor and the Council. These pressures together with revenues that have not fully rebounded to uh, pre-recession levels, of course, makes it difficult to continue to be competitive while providing much-needed services and programs to the residents of the District of Columbia as well as businesses. But let me uh, say to this committee that we will rise to the challenge. The budget passed by the Council will represent a focus on the District's core priorities of being fiscally responsible, continuing education reform, economic opportunity and public safety. Because of the ongoing legislative process, I am unable to forecast exactly where each dollar will be budgeted until we vote, of course, on the Budget Request Act on May 25th. We will comply with, of course, our open meetings law by uh, openly debating the proposals for spending cuts as well as revenue enhancements. Each Council member's priority will be the subject of negotiation. Every budgetary shift will be reviewed. However, let me guarantee you, as the Chairman of the Council of the District of Columbia, we will pass a balanced and structurally sound budget request to send to this Congress. After the Council reaches consensus and passes the budget, I, I welcome, quite frankly, the opportunity to brief any member of this subcommittee personally on the Council's modifications uh, to the Mayor's budget proposal. In order for the District to provide vital services to the public, I ask that you pass this year's Appropriation Act in a time for the start of the new fiscal year and that you provide those citizens of the United States of America who call the district their home the right to govern their own affairs through their representation of their elected officials. Let me stop to uh, thank uh, all of the members of this committee, of Congress as well as the President, uh, for keeping the government open. Uh, as you know, had negotiations failed and the government shut down, the District of Columbia would have been the only place in the United States of America where U.S. citizens would have been left without the basic government services enjoyed by developing countries, such as trash collection or pest control or interpretation services for the blind. All of these services and many more would have been suspended because the district lacks the power to continue to spend even its tax dollars in the event of a Federal shutdown. As you know, these services, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, uh, constituents should not go without. Yet even under the circumstances where no government shutdown is at stake, the citizen of the district should always be able to assert local control over its local funds. And I would, I would hope uh, that you would work with the members of this committee uh, to give the district budget autonomy that the residents in the districts deserve. In closing, let me uh, say that we are willing and able to stand with this committee to work together, to work together on the things that we can move this great city forward, uh, knowing that we may not agree on everything. But the things that we do agree and have in common, we should do everything in our power to continue to give the residents of this great country the opportunity to flourish and make this, continue to make this the greatest nation in the universe. On that note, uh, I look forward to questions and answers, and thank you for allowing me an opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, in an effort to be good stewards of both your times and recognizing that there is a a panel uh, to come behind you. We want, we want to be good stewards of their times. I am going to uh, uh, recognize myself for five minutes of questions, and I am going to hopefully impose the same uh, green, yellow, red light barriers on myself that uh, we will subsequently be imposing. And what I would like to do and acknowledge up 
front, Mayor Gray, Mr. Chairman, is there is not a governmental entity, I don't think anywhere, that is not uh, struggling with the same things that you uh, have just uh, elucidated. Uh, in, in Spartanburg County, which is my home county, we had furloughs uh, last year of, of, of law enforcement officers and prosecutors. Uh, the State of South Carolina uh, is struggling. Uh, heavens knows the United States Congress is struggling uh, with respect to its fiscal obligations. So, what I'd love to do is is ask a question, give both of you a chance to answer it, and uh, kind of seek your uh, your perspective on the on the challenges that you faced as you propose your budget. And it looks like Medicaid. Um, if I read your your testimony and the documents prepared correctly, Medicaid continues to be the largest single expenditure. Are, are there any lessons that you can share with the panel uh, with respect to how you uh, uh, are, are dealing with Medicaid, any reforms that you would advocate, uh, any, any pearls of wisdom or perspectives that you could lend to us as we struggle with the same thing in South Carolina and in the United States Congress? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you know, Medicaid uh, is, an, is a uh, key part of health care reform uh, as we move forward. Uh, we have quite a robust Medicaid program in the District of Columbia, and in fact, it has been uh, essential in our ability to have such a low rate of uninsured uh, people in the District of Columbia. We have only 6 percent of our adults who don't have some form of insurance in the city, and uh, only 3 percent of our children uh, who are not insured. Um, one of the things that we have done uh, is to start to look at every one of our optional services. As you well know, they are mandated services and they are optional services to make sure those services are delivered in the most efficient uh, way. Um, I am delighted to have brought in a gentleman, Wayne Turnage, uh, who is very experienced. He happened to have been, uh, worked in Virginia for a number of years in health care and health care reform, and brings that experience uh, to us uh, here in the District of Columbia. Uh, we have brought in uh, an ASO, an administrative services organization, that is helping us to manage, and we are increasingly, uh, we're increasingly now focusing on the use of managed care organizations to try to start to in influence uh, health care behavior. One of the things that we have in the city that we are working on, it is going to take some time, is to try to make sure that we have health care services uh, spread across the city. Uh, we will, in the next uh, year, uh, open three additional clinics in areas that have historically been underserved. And we believe that that will facilitate uh, the use of uh, insurance tools like Medicaid because people will have services more accessible to them. So I think, you know, in terms of lessons, if there, if there have been any, it would be to try to make sure that we have external controls, uh, external uh, assistance, like with an administrative services organization, and try to increasingly make health care more accessible to people who may have the insurance, may have the coverage, but if they don't have access to services, they are not likely to use them except on an emergent basis. Chairman Brown, let, let me ask you this. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting your chief of police, uh, with whom uh, I was very impressed. I have had the pleasure of meeting your attorney general, uh, who I similarly have been impressed with. But it also appears as if uh, the budget proposes a cut uh, with respect to public safety. Uh, how do you decide which areas to cut, uh, given the fact that is a core function of government? Kind of what process did you go through? Um, and can the citizens of the district expect to see any diminution in services given the cuts? Well, I mean, the budget that is uh, in front of the, uh, the Council of the District of Columbia currently, there is clearly a lot of discussion going on to make sure. Uh, that uh, from a public safety standpoint and a reduction of officers, that that doesn't happen. I think the Mayor's proposal uh, doesn't quite lay that out, that there would be a reduction of police officers. But we want to get uh, the uh, officers, number of officers back up to appropriate level. And I think an additional 100 officers or 200 officers is where we want to go, somewhere between 38 and 3,900 officers. And I think this is a, a phenomenal opportunity. Uh, to really focus uh, as all the members want to move in that same direction. So I don't think what you will see as it relates to a budget proposal is a reduction of police officers in the District of Columbia. All right. I will try to lead by example when the yellow light is on. So I am going to recognize uh, the distinguished gentleman from Illinois, uh, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mayor Gray, Mr. Brown. Thank you both for being here. You know, many American citizens, as well as people 
around the world would be surprised to learn that the Congress of the United States has to approve the local budget of the nation's capital, a city of 600,000 residents, before it can spend its own local taxpayer money. Uh, in 2003, a Republican-controlled Senate passed a bill by unanimous consent to allow the district's local budget to take effect without congressional approval. Former President George Bush supported budget autonomy in his fiscal year, 2004 to 6 budgets, and President Obama supported budget autonomy in his fiscal year 2012 budget. Congresswoman Norton has introduced, reintroduced, actually, her budget autonomy bill this Congress, uh, Mayor Gray and Mr. Brown both. If the District of Columbia were to be able to set its own fiscal year and implement its local budget without congressional approval, how would that affect the district's ability to provide service to its residents? Well, I, th I think, I think Mr. Uh, Congressman Davis, that it really would provide um, enormous flexibility uh, to us. Uh, now we have a situation where our budget is essentially adopted at the city level uh, in June and not later than July. And then we have characteristically gone many months thereafter without having an approved budget because of the need to send it to uh, Congress. The average time has been about four months. Uh, in this instance, I think it was more like six or seven months uh, this fiscal year. Frankly, it also would probably give us an opportunity to adopt a different fiscal year. Uh, what we have now uh, is a fiscal year that is, a, is, a, is adapted to the Federal fiscal year, October 1 to uh, September 30. Uh, just one of the practical problems that that creates is that our school system, uh, and that is the largest budget but for Medicaid uh, in the District of Columbia, actually spans two fiscal years because the school year starts uh, in one fiscal year, and that is in August, uh, and you have expenditures associated with that school year uh, from August until September 30th. And then you have the rest of the fiscal year or the rest of the school year beginning October 1st and running until the next June. So it would allow us to streamline um, our, our, uh, our operation of our services. Also, frankly, it would give us more time to have a better sense of what the uh, revenue projections are likely to be and to be able to uh, look at data from the most recent past as we craft the budget for the future. So again, being able to streamline how we operate and having a, a better timetable that we could operate on in terms of projecting uh, what our expenditures and revenues would be would be two of the the biggest uh, gains that we would experience. Thank you. Let me ask you, Mr. Brown. We, we, we've, uh, we've had continuing resolutions since 1870, technically, but you don't really expect to have continuing resolution after continuing resolution after continuing resolution up to the point of brinksmanship. How does operating under these continuing resolutions affect the budgeting process and the operation of city government for the District of Columbia? Well, first of all, let me start and uh, thank you for all of your support uh, of the District of Columbia. Uh, clearly, as it relates to budget autonomy, I uh, think you understand the importance of it and always been a strong supporter working with uh, Congressman Norton on these particular matters. Um, your question has to do with how does Congress amend the District's budget and if, you know, what is the continuance resolutions? Um, clearly what role does it play. What is interesting that, you know, Congress has not amended our budget. Uh, and when you look at, um, since I have been on the Council, they have never amended the budget. So the, the clear question is why do we have these resolutions over and over and over, DCRs over and over again? I think it gives an opportunity to set a clear direction of where we want to go, it gives a clear uh, understanding of how we get there. Uh, and I look forward to uh, working with you and others to see how we can uh, get budget autonomy passed for the district. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair will now recognize the uh, gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Mayor, um, I know we all share a, a common thread in regards to educating our, our children. And, you know, looking at the budget, we had about a 5.4 percent increase in education uh, funding. Are you concerned about that? I am concerned only, uh, uh, Dr. Gosar, that we can't invest even more. 
money in education. Uh, education reform uh, has been afoot now for several years in the District of Columbia, and it is a huge uh, priority of mine. Some of the increases, frankly, reflect um, an increased enrollment. For the first time in 41 years, <clears throat> we saw an increase uh, enrollment in our traditional public schools. And for, for the first time since the advent of charter schools, we saw an increased enrollment in both. We uh, had an increased enrollment of about 900 children in the traditional D.C. public schools this year and another 1,700 in charter schools for an enrollment increase of 2,600. So carrying that forward, some of the increases in our budget are to, ins are to ensure that we provide an adequate education for those children as well as projected enrollment increases. We have made a very healthy investment also in uh, pre-kindergarten early childhood education services. And um, as a result, I think that is a contributing factor uh, to our enrollment increases, and we want to continue to do that because we recognize getting these children at the earliest possible point will make a huge difference uh, in educational outcomes and, frankly, life, life outcomes. The other thing that we are doing, uh, Dr. Gosar, is um, we are tackling a problem now that has been longstanding, and that is how we educate children with disabilities in the District of Columbia. Uh, we have had far too many children who have had to be educated in uh, non-public tuition placements, as we call them, at great expense uh, to the city. Uh, last year we spent about $160 million on those children, plus another $93 million on transportation of kids with disabilities in traditional public schools, charter schools, and non-public placements. So we are going to invest more in our public education system next year hopefully to in incentivize that system to begin to bring our children back in the public education system to comply with the law of the land, which changed in 1975 and still, of course, is, exists uh, in 2011 in the uh, in form of the uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So um, I think we are making progress on the education front. We still have a very, very long ways to go to be able to say that we are ad adequately educating every child, but I think we are going in the right direction. You know, I am sure you are aware that we had H.R. 471, the, the, the Scholarships for Opportunity and Results Act. I am also from Arizona that struggles with the same type of educational aspect. And it is, you know, we look at everything on, on the table, all aspects of where we can go with assets um, to, to try to uh, attain and help every child. Um, do you support that act? I support strong public education, Dr. Gosar, and that is where I have placed my emphasis. Um, I believe that education uh, and strong public education is the great emancipator. It is the great liber liberator. It is what levels the playing field. And so I have placed my emphasis, and I have indicated uh, here before, on public education. I will continue to do that. I will implement whatever you know, laws and programs are uh, required of the District of Columbia, of course. But as a product of public education of this city, I know what it can do for children. I have seen what it can do for children, and I want, to have, I want us to have the strongest possible public education system. And we have a lot of choice. We have a lot of choice uh, in terms of 123 traditional public schools, and we now have the most robust charter movement in the country, 52 charter schools operating on 93 campuses with almost 30,000 children enrolled in those programs. So we probably we probably offer the greatest variety of choices in public education uh, when compared to anywhere else in the nation. Well, I would hope that, um, particularly in light of the, const or the Supreme Court ruling with Arizona with the voucher system, that we would also embrace um, the, the voucher system uh, and look at it as a tool in order to, to facilitate all children all across the board, because there are, um, you need all opportunities uh, to, to embrace children. So I would hope that we would really, truly look at that, that system and integrate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Gosar. Uh, the Chair would now recognize uh, the ranking member of the full committee, the distinguished gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Chairman, uh, I, I yield to Ms. Ms. Norton, please. Now you go, please, Ms. Norton. Uh, I thank the, the ranking member for his generosity in yielding me, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first, let me, let me commend the Mayor and the Council Chair on how well you work together on, on the budget, even while the Chairman and his subcommittees have engaged in very rigorous uh, oversight of your budget. I know it is awkward for you to appear 
to discuss the budget when there is no budget. Uh, but I want, to, as far as you go, I want to commend you on the budget that the mayor, first you, you uh, Mayor Gray, have submitted that budget. We, we of course, uh, see it's not the final budget. It's not the District of Columbia budget. It is a tough budget with admirable balance. It spreads the pain. Uh, it does so. Uh, it gives us, and what is this, your 13th year of a balanced budget um, without drawing from uh, your cumulative fund balance, your reserve balance. I wonder if there's another jurisdiction in the United States that even has a reserve, much less not drawing a penny from it in order to balance its budget. Uh, you have not you have shown yourself not wedded to any ideological catechism in drawing your bu budget, but requiring the whole city to participate in what it takes to balance a budget. And you, Chairman Brown, uh, uh, your, your oversight, I, I see from uh, Channel 16, or was it Channel 13, and, and from the papers has been very rigorous. Um, you are apparently making changes while keeping the rigors represented by the Mayor's budget. I think both of you are a model for the Congress of working together on a budget without rancor uh, and uh, of working together in the first place. I, I apologize for the extra cost to the district in redundant budget processes and hope that the committee will understand from your testimony the urgent need for, uh, for uh, budget autonomy. Um, I, I want to discuss a subject close to my heart. The Chairman says correctly that the budget is not amended. The budget is never amended. No one here would know how to amend the budget. I don't have a clue how to change the budget. No one can get into those weeds except you. The budget is here for one purpose. The budget is here for riders because members from Arizona want you to do what they do in Arizona, or members from Ohio want you to do what they do in Ohio. The rider, I, I want to speak about one of those riders. For about 10 years, Congress kept the district from spending its own local funds on needle exchange programs, even though every large city and many smaller jurisdictions use needle exchange programs uh, because they have been found to be effective uh, by all the objective uh, organizations in, in reducing the spread of HIV AIDS. House Republicans, once again, in light of, even in light of this evidence, tried to reimpose this ban this year after we got the ban off uh, in the prior years. Uh, we were able to resist that. But I have to ask both of you, what would be the impact uh, of, on, on, the, on HIV AIDS rate in the District of Columbia? First, how did it affect the city generally? And what would you do if Congress were to reimpose this rider on the District of Columbia that, again, which has taken so many lives here in this city? Well, frankly, um, the, the needle exchange program has been an, an, uh, an incredibly important tool for us in fighting uh, HIV and AIDS in the District of Columbia. The national average is 1 percent, and anything above that would be regarded as an epidemic. Um, we have a 3 percent rate overall in the District of Columbia of, of people who are uh, HIV positive uh, or have AIDS. Do you AIDS. think that is directly traceable to the rider? Well, I don't know if it is directly traceable to the rider or not, but certainly having a tool available to us to attack this problem is going to reduce the transmission of the virus. Um, we know that our in intravenous um, uh, drug use is now one of the most prevalent ways in which the, the virus is transmitted. Um, and being able to have people uh, access clean needles has made a difference uh, in how the, the, the uh, virus is transmitted. The absence of that, I think, is going to result in a rise uh, in the transmission of the virus in the city. 
Uh, and Frank, you asked the question what we would do uh, when, we, when the ban was in place before. There was an organization, Prevention Works, that came into being that raised private dollars in order to run this program. Uh, and in fact, it is now out of business uh, because they could not sustain themselves. So, uh, Congresswoman Norton, I am not really sure what we would do. Uh, we ought to have the flexibility, as I think more than 200 cities now nationally do, to be able to continue to operate this program. It is an important uh, prevention technique. It has proven its worth, and we need to have this available to us. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman Brown, did you want to say anything on that issue? Well, uh, I would, let me just start to say that the Department of uh, Health's HIV, AIDS, Hepatitis, STD, and TB administration, it has to be commended. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman I hate to interrupt you, but I, I want to be fair to everyone. And what I would propose is, after I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, to maybe have a lightning round, if Mr. Mayor, if you would be willing to have just maybe one quick question so I can get all of Ms. Holmes Norton's questions asked, but also be fair to the gentleman from Maryland. So at this point, I would recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you for calling this hearing. I want to thank Ms. Norton and certainly for her advocacy for the district. And to you, Mayor, and to you, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for being here. Um, I, I, I literally reside in two cities, Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. And um, I must tell you, as I listen to you, Mr. Mayor, and to you, Mr. Brown, uh, and then I combine what you have said this morning to what I read in the Washington Post this morning, where it said, and I quote, for more than a dozen, Alice Rivlin, Senior F uh, Fellow of Economic Studies at Brookings, said, more than a dozen years, for more than a dozen years, D.C. has been a model of fiscal responsibility. And it goes on to say that Matt Fabian, managing director of the independent research firm Municipal Market Advisors, said that the district operates in a highly conservative manner with a strong financial management team and institutionalized financial controls, even as the economy struggled. He found the district faring better than most other cities and states. He said something. I think that, you know, I noticed the media, all of them are up in here today. And if we need to do nothing else, we need to give you credit for what you've done and for your predecessors have done. Um, but the thing that made my heart glad, as my mother would say, is that not only are you doing this thing, managing the money that you have well and you're making the cuts that you got to do and doing what you got to do, but you're also doing it with compassion. I heard you talk about the 6 percent and 3 percent the adult, 3 percent children uninsured. I think that's what you said, Mr. Mayor. Is that right? That's right, sir. You know, and you talked about spreading the clinics, having more clinics. And you talked about basically wellness and prevention. That's what you're talking about. This Congress could take some lessons from D.C. Uh, and it is interesting that you have to come up here and go through these changes. Since the District of Columbia government cannot obligate or expend its locally raised funds until Congress appropriates these funds back to the district, the District of Columbia government would have, would have had to shut down if the Federal Government shut down during the fiscal year 2011 federal spending fight, even though the district had passed its budget the prior spring. Duh. If I recall correctly, Congresswoman Norton offered multiple amendment, amendments at the Rules Committee to allow the District of Columbia to continue to spend its local funds for the remainder of fiscal year 2011. The Republicans rejected each of these amendments and refused to consider her standalone bill that would have accomplished the same goal. Mayor Gray, how much time did uh, you and other members of your administration have to devote to shut down contingency planning? Um, it was scores of hours and scores of people who worked on it. The city administrator had the uh, responsibility, Mr. Cummings, for um, directing this effort. We had the city administrator, all the deputy mayors, and every department uh, head involved in this exercise in putting together a plan. 
beginning with going back and researching what happened uh, about 15 years ago when this occurred uh, previously. Um, a plan was put together, um, and frankly, had it been implemented, and you heard uh, the Chairman talk about this, Chairman Brown talk about this, there would have been service shutdowns that really would have affected adversely the people of the District of Columbia. Libraries would have been shut down, trash would not have been picked up, the Department of Motor Vehicles would have had to shut down, our Consumer and Regulatory Affairs Agency would have, been, uh, would have had to shut down. Uh, and frankly, we have the money in our budget to be able to do that. We were being treated like another department of the Federal Government when, in fact, we aren't. We are not the Department of Commerce or Justice or Health and Human Services or Interior or any other department like that. We are a separate jurisdiction. We raise $5.5 billion a year to support those services. We had a balanced budget that we adopted, as you have indicated, last spring uh, and early summer and we are ready to implement that. We never should have been caught in this. And frankly, having to put together a shutdown plan diverted the attention of our department uh, heads as well as our other leaders from running the services every day in order to craft a plan in anticipation of a shutdown. Well, thank you very much. I see my time has expired, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Uh, Mr. Gray, I believe, if I recall correctly, you have a city business to attend to beginning at, at 930? Yes, sir. I have to be back up uh, shortly, uh, back up to the Wilson Building. Uh, with with, with uh, Chairman Brown, I know you have important business to uh, to tend to as well, and we have another panel. So, I, what what I would propose is maybe a, a, a continuing dialogue. I know that you have one with Ms. Holmes Norton, and I'm sure others, and been gracious enough to host me as well. Love to talk to you about the, about the Metro and. Um, Anything else on your on, on your minds? But I also want to keep my word and uh, and, and get you where you need to get. So, um, yes, ma'am. Mr. Chairman, just for the record, um, uh, in light of the fact that Mr. Cummings is here, I, I would like to note for the record that uh, Mr. Cummings' uh, city, Baltimore, has had needle exchange. Baltimore is a city that struggles uh, considerably more than the district. This has been a white collar town. The district had the, has had the highest AIDS rate in the United States, higher than our, our good sister Baltimore. One would not have expected that, and it would not have been the case uh, if the Congress of the United States had not denied the District of Columbia the right to spend its own local money to save the lives of District of Columbia residents. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh Mayor Gray, the distinguished gentleman from California, the, the, the chairman of the full committee, a lot of us, as you know, have to go from committee to committee, judiciary is having one this morning as well. I don't know whether your schedule will allow me. Of course. Yeah. I, then I would recognize, and thank you for that, Mr. Mr. Gray, but I would recognize the distinguished gentleman from California, the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mayor. Chairman, I, I really appreciate you making the time this morning. Hopefully this can be a regular dialogue, not always uh, at a formal hearing, but uh, uh, under both of my predecessors, I think there, there continued to be a good relationship. Uh, one of the challenges, and the gentlelady from the District of Columbia does a good job of representing uh, a point of view of the district, but uh, one of the things that we seem to see here is that there are more views of the district than just hers. Uh, and I might note and, and ask you to comment on uh, the impact of both chartered public schools and uh, uh, the private school community within the district and, and how you, you feel you will work with uh, uh, Federal funding that, that helps in that effort. Uh, well, we will we'll try to make everything work that that's required of us. I, as I indicated, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, earlier, uh, we have a very robust commitment uh, to public education in the city. We are making uh, very substantial investments in that regard. Um, the biggest increase in this budget proposed for fiscal year 12 is in public education, uh, and especially in early childhood education and trying to get our kids with disabilities back into public education uh, environments. So for me, and I have said it many times before, I think that the, uh, the future lies for us in having a robust public education system. Uh, our charter movement, I think, is second to none uh, in the nation. As I indicated earlier, we have 52 charter schools. We are adding four more uh, on 93 campuses, and they serve now 30,000 children. 
uh, close to it, which prevents and provides, excuse me, an opportunity to uh, offer an enormous amount of choice uh, to our kids. Um, it's the first time we've seen enrollments, uh, enrollment increases in our traditional public education in, in 41 years, and the first time since the advent of charters back in the 90s that we've seen enrollment increases in both. So I think we're going in the right direction. Let me have a follow-up question on a completely different subject, but I think one that's near and dear to, uh, to all of us who went through uh, a series of continuing resolutions, no, no budget last year, uh, essentially one after another short-term financing of, of the government, and I know that impacts you as the Federal city. If we are able to come up with a, uh, a system that allows you to continue operating, not with Federal funds, but with your own means, uh, if for any reason there is a, uh, a break in, uh, in full funding, or in another way of putting it, even if there isn't, if we wait to the 11th hour, for you to maintain all services, uh, even through a, uh, uh, a period of uncertainty, do you believe you are prepared to do that uh, on an annual basis with a budget that reflects a contingency for no Federal funds coming? Well, for the most part, we, we receive Federal funds in the same way that other States do. Now, I understand that, but, uh, you know, if the Federal Government had not fully funded all aspects of the Government, uh, the States would have been without certain Federal funds, but they would have, for example, picked up Medicaid. No Medicaid person would have found themselves without money because the States, as sovereigns, would have found a way to meet their, their obligation, even if Federal funds were delayed. My question to you, and it is an important question, when you look at your budget and contingencies, if we essentially allow for the, uh, the city to be, at least on an annual basis, early on disconnected from what may or may not happen in a continuing resolution, a budget battle, a debt ceiling, all of those uh, which I think this committee is concerned, are you able to give us a contingent budget that shows that for X period of time you can continue to provide all the required services of the Federal city. And I, I said Federal city because we are not just talking about school. We are talking about police and all the functions, many of which are ultimately services that are provided often with reimbursement. You know, your, your city receives a certain amount of, of impact aid equivalent to make up for the fact that embassies don't pay property tax and so on. So my question today is one of, can you now or in the near future give us, if you will, a contingency plan so that this committee could look at a way to say, okay, per that plan on an annual basis, we can forward allocate uh, authorization so that the District of Columbia is never caught up in what might be weeks or months of uncertainty in the budget process. I would like to see the city have that capability on a go-forward basis, but I am looking for some sort of a uh, structured mechanism to where this committee could say they have a plan, they can live without Federal dollars and still meet the requirement, and each time that is uh, received, it would allow us to say, we have no reason to be in the way of your spending your dollars if you can make the commitment. And we all understand the contingent plan would not fully fund everything you want to do, and it may not be able to do it for a full year. But can you comment on that? Well, first of all, again, as I indicated, we raised $5.5 billion uh, in local tax dollars, and many of our services— By the way, I am very aware that I pay twice as much as a non-voter in the District of Columbia than your voters do. And I am very aware that you have a, a wonderful scheme to, uh, to make sure those without representation pay twice as much tax. But go ahead, please. I would like to hear more about that so we can expand it uh, to, <laughs> to others. Um, no, I, I think you know, many of our services It is called your homestead, but go ahead. <laughs> many, many of our services, as you know, uh, Mr. Chairman, are uh, completely funded with local dollars. And we certainly would be prepared to be able to do that with budget or autonomy. That is one of the uh, points that we have made. Again, and I think you are saying this as well, if there was something like Medicaid, for us, our Medicaid formula is 70-30, 70 percent Federal, 30 percent uh, local. And that the formula is no less than 50-50 for every State. So we wouldn't find ourselves in any different situation than the uh, States would on programs like that. 
But those things that are wholly funded, I think we've by, with local dollars, we, we've demonstrated we can do that and we're prepared to do that. Uh, that's one of the, uh, I think, strongest arguments we have for budget autonomy, that if you look back over the last 13 to 15 years, we've indicated that we've had, you know, we've had balanced budgets, we've had clean audits, and demonstrated our ability to manage our finances in a very prudent manner. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for his indulgence and yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me uh, quickly recognize the uh, gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and let me appreciate your sensitivity to the needs of our witnesses to move on to other pressing business. I also appreciate the presence of both the chairman of the full committee and the ranking member as an indication of how important this issue is to all of us. And I would ask unanimous consent to submit for the record an opening statement as well as a, an editorial from the Washington Post entitled, Congress Should Loosen Its Fiscal Reins on D.C. And I yield back. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Davis. Without objection, indeed, all members may have seven days to submit opening statements uh, for the record and any other extraneous material. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Chairman, on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you for uh, for your time. And uh, as the second panel approaches, we will take a brief recess. And if, if you got an extra second, I would like to come down and, uh, and thank you both in person. Oh, <laughs>